previously on The Hunger Games. Rue Malak, daughter of Peter and Katniss Malak, was chosen to be the female tribute for District 12 in the 90th Hunger Games. For the special quell this year, the tributes were not allowed to meet or even see each other before the games began. They were placed into an astounding arena of six different sectors. Despite a narrow escape in the bloodbath, Rue fell into an alliance with the three surviving career tributes before they travelled through the arena, killing any tributes that they found. After being alerted to the presence of gift bags at the perimeter of the arena, Rue and her de facto district partner, Phenomenon, made their way to collect them. Once they reached the collection point, Rue's bag gave away the fact that she was from District 12, with Phenomenon revealing that he had known from early on that she was lying about being from District 1. Rue slowly began to stumble back from Phenomenon, but before she could even raise her bow and arrow, he slashed his sword against Rue's shoulder, leaving her with a slight wound. Blood poured from Rue's shoulder as she fell to the sandy ground, and Phenomenon pounced upon her, holding her down with his arms whilst his sword pierced her neck. Phenomenon said that she was lucky that he had kept her alive so far, especially as she was from such a down district. He proceeded to ask Rue why she had lied about what she was plotting. Rue desperately replied that she had to lie about being from a career district, or the others would have likely killed her, especially as she was an outlier, before claiming that she was not plotting anything other than to survive. Phenomenon spat on the ground in disgust, and said that Rue was lying again, before raising his sword in the air while she screamed. Yet when Phenomenon raised his sword, Rue used her free hand to grab some of the sand, which he threw straight at Phenomenon's eyes. He yelled in pain and held a hand to his eyes, before swiping the ground with his sword, narrowly missing Rue's neck. As she lay beneath him, she punched him in the stomach, before thrusting herself backwards. Rue scarpered away from Phenomenon's blind and inaccurate swipes, before grabbing her bow and shooting her arrow straight at his heart. Phenomenon spluttered and fell forwards as Rue lay in exhaustion upon the ground. A cannon sounded, and she jumped up to the gift bags that lay ahead of her. However, when Rue opened the bag labelled 12, she seemed disappointed to only find a metal bottle of water inside. She quickly checked the other bags and found that they contained the same bottles, before sighing. Rue still said thank you to nobody in particular before pocketing her bottle. Rue buried the bag labelled 12 and headed back with the other bags towards the edge of the dune sector, where she had agreed to meet Helena and Neptune. When they heard the cannon, they did not seem worried, and they arrived at the shore of the island sector shortly afterwards before resting and looking out into the idyllic waters. Remarkably, no other tributes were killed during this episode, with most accessing their gift bags or stealing the gift bags from other tributes who did not take them. Approximately an hour later, Rue reached Neptune and Helena on the coast of the Dune Sector, between two islands on the eastern shore of the island sector. Helena had asked Neptune to keep watch over her while she floated in the nearby waters, seemingly without a care in the world, as the red stains in her hair were finally washed out, creating a bloody hue in the water around her. Neptune asked Rue what had happened to Phenomenon, and Rue said that he had turned on her, before giving Neptune the gift bags for District 2. Neptune hardly reacted to Rue's news about Phenomenon's death, and instead seemed annoyed about the simplicity of the gift bag's contents. He then noticed Rue's wounds from where Phenomenon had pierced her back, before suggesting that Rue should ask sponsors for a medical kit, but she adamantly told him that she felt fine. For the rest of the afternoon, Neptune and Rue rested on the sandy shore, keeping watch for other tributes in the dunes behind them and the islands in front of them, but they did not see any. As for Helena, she eventually came back to the shore, saying that she felt clean again, before letting her hair dry out in the heat of the dune sector. The hours went by, and Rue's neck wounds seemed to be healing, but it was still bleeding slightly. As it began to get dark, Helena noticed the blood running down Rue's neck, and she asked Rue about this wound. Rue explained what happened, and whilst Helena seemed unable to take her eyes off the wound, Rue said that it would be good if they were all given a medical kit, before looking upwards. A minute later, Neptune spotted a sponsor gift coming down towards the nearby water, and Helena offered to get it, before running back into the water, as Rue quietly placed her arrow in her bow. Rue watched intently as Helena waded towards the bag that had just landed in the water. But when Helena shouted that it was for her and Neptune, Rue seemed relieved. Helena realised that it was a medical pack, and she tended to several cuts and bruises that she and Neptune had so far experienced. However, after a few minutes, Neptune insisted that they use one of the bandages on Rue's neck wound, and Helena willingly offered to apply this bandage. 
Rue seemed somewhat uncomfortable as Helena sniffed her wound, but once it was in place, Rue thanked Helena and walked back to their supplies to grab some food, yet just as she began to eat some bread, a cannon was heard. The trio immediately looked around and Helena claimed that she heard a scream from the tropical sector that lay on the other side of the island sector. This was most likely correct, due to the cannon belonging to Mayambao from Nine, who had just been fatally pecked in the neck by a flock of toucans within the tropical sector. A moment later, Neptune shouted in horror when he saw a nest of scorpions scurrying across the sand, just metres from him. A scorpion climbed onto Neptune's boot and appeared to be entering his trouser leg, but he rapidly kicked it into the air before shouting at Rue and Helena that they needed to protect their supplies from these animals. The girls sprinted towards the supplies as well, crushing several scorpions beneath their feet as they did so. Rue, Neptune and Helena proceeded to kick, swipe and stab as many scorpions as they could. Initially, the trio were able to fend them off, but they began to hear screams coming from the edge of an island behind them, and Helena looked around to see arms thrashing around within the water. Viewers could see that Treble and Kimbu, both from Four, had been hiding in the water and watching the careers and Rue on the shoreline, but a shark had been released into this sector, and likely due to Kimbu's earlier wound, it had found them. Although the shark had already bitten them each several times, it was not visible from the dune sector, and both Kimbu and Treble were still desperately trying to reach the safety of the shore. Helena ran towards the water, and while still defending the supplies, Neptune shouted at her, asking what she was doing, but just before diving into the water, she shouted back that she was going to get them. Without Helena's help, the scorpions soon became too many in number for Neptune and Rue to defend. Neptune shouted at Rue to grab any supplies they could and run into the water, which the scorpions seemed scared to enter. Rue and Neptune salvaged some food and water in the process, before watching an annoyance as the rest of their supplies were destroyed and contaminated by the scorpions. As they watched from the shallow water at the edge of the island sector, Helena continued to swim quickly towards Treble, who had now been dragged beneath the water's surface by the shark, and Kimbu, who had just floated up to the surface. Yet Neptune and Rue soon noticed the blue water turning red, and as a cannon sounded, Neptune shouted at Helena to come back. When a second cannon sounded, Helena finally stopped swimming and looked back at Neptune, who was still shouting at her. She turned around and looked in wonder at the blood-tinged water that was flowing towards her, before finally spotting the fin of the shark appearing above the water's surface. Helena screamed, before turning back and swimming as quickly as she could towards the shore whilst Neptune and Rue looked on. But a few seconds later, she was suddenly pulled beneath the surface of the water. Neptune ran into the water after Helena with a spear, and Rue looked on in amazement. The underwater cameras showed the shark continuing to bite at Helena's right leg, and she was clearly in pain, but she succeeded in stabbing the shark several times in the face, which eventually forced it to let go of her, and as it swam away, she floated back up to the surface. Within a few minutes, the scorpions and all other animals had made their way back to the perimeters through which they had entered, and without wasting any time, Neptune dove into the water towards Helena. Rue at first called him back, before quietly watching. Neptune grabbed onto Helena, who was now barely conscious, before bringing her back to the shore, where the damage to her leg was now clear for viewers to see. Although Helena was bleeding profusely through many large bite marks all over her leg, it had miraculously missed any major arteries. However, Helena soon passed out on the sandy shore, and Rue lay her jacket beneath Helena's leg, before covering her wounds with clothing, and other supplies that had not been covered in sand. Neptune aided Rue, and remarkably, Helena's wounds stopped bleeding for the most part. As the sun began to set, Rue and Neptune looked around, and although most of their supplies had been contaminated or destroyed, they appeared pleased to still be alive. Once the darkness of night had completely set in, Neptune took the first watch, whilst Helena recovered and slept, with her leg having been bandaged by Rue, who appeared unable to sleep. She joined Neptune, sitting across the fire from him, while he appeared almost hypnotised by the waves that were crashing against the nearby shore every few seconds. They sat in silence for a moment, until Neptune asked Rue how she had learned to tend to wounds. She seemed to think deeply, before replying that she had learned to do so in the last year when training for the games. Neptune looked back at Rue quizzically, before stating that her medical skills were rather advanced for only one year of training, yet Rue simply looked back to Neptune and replied, thank you. She seemed to want to change the focus of the conversation, and so she asked Neptune why he had volunteered for the games. He appeared bemused by this question, but as he looked up, he stated that it was written in the stars, 
and that his parents had really pressured him into it now that he was 18 years old. Ruth stared at Neptune as he continued to look towards the stars, and Eugenia commented that she would love to know what they were both thinking in that moment. Ruth said that she had also been pressured into the games, but that she was pleased at least to be representing their district. Neptune nodded in agreement, before grinning and saying that it was still a bit weird. Ruth began to laugh, and Neptune joined in, but she looked towards the location of a camera before turning back and saying, You said it, not me, which made Neptune laugh a little more. He said to Rue that she would need some rest before her shift began, and she soon headed back to the location where Helena slept. Rue lay down with a bow and arrow gripped firmly in her hands, and she began to fall asleep, but was awoken by the sound of Horn of Plenty. The portraits of Phenomenon from one, Treble and Kimbu both from four, and Mayambal from nine were shown in the sky. This left only eight tributes remaining, Neptune and Helena both from two, Zuckerberg from three, Juliana from 5, Panama from 6, Brian from 10, and Elixio and Rue, both from 12. As the sun rose the next morning, Rue awoke Neptune and Helena. She brought Neptune some fruit, and she asked to look at Helena's wounds that had healed to some degree during the night. Rue made attempts to speak to Neptune over the next hour, but he acted rather distantly towards her, and looked silently ahead for most of this time. Rue seemed concerned, but after a few minutes, Helena stated that she was worried about staying in this sector, and they were too exposed to the other tributes. Although Rue argued that it would be best to stay where they were, Neptune agreed with Helena, and within five minutes, they were making their way southeast along the edge of the dune sector, towards a long, narrow island that reached all the way to the tropical sector on the other side. Helena experienced pain when walking, and often complained to Rue that she needed her bandages reapplied, which significantly slowed down the group's movement. Yet once they set foot upon the island, the more solid ground appeared to help Helena's movement, and she was able to walk with less difficulty. They headed through a forest of thick trees, along a path that lay directly to the right of a steep hill that ran all the way down to the beach. As they walked, Neptune was asking Helena how her leg felt, and the pair debated travelling onwards to the tropical sector, but shortly after they began this conversation, Rue suddenly stopped in her tracks and held up her hand to silence Neptune and Helena. They appeared worried, and Rue pointed up to the hill to her right, silently mouthing that she had heard movement. The trio stood still in silence, but after a few seconds, Helena leaned forwards and looked through the trees that lay up the hill, before grinning at Rue and saying that there was nobody there. Neptune looked at Rue and Helena let out a small giggle, before limping past Rue and continuing along the path. A second later, the ground exploded beneath her. Whilst Helena's right leg was blown off and she was blasted upwards into a low-hanging branch, Rue and Neptune were also thrown through the air. They proceeded to tumble down the hill, dropping their supplies and weapons, repeatedly hitting tree trunks and bushes, until they eventually came to a standstill on the sandy beach by the water. As Neptune painfully tried to get to his feet, he began to hear shouting coming from up the hill, which belonged to Zuckerberg from three and Juliana from five. It had been seen by viewers that during the first night, this pair had managed to extract a mine from the cornucopia before carefully retrieving it. They had been watching the trio since the shark attacked, and when Juliana realised that they would be walking along this path, she ordered Zuckerberg to place this mine where Helena was stood. They only just managed to activate it, cover it with dirt, and run away in time. Zuckerberg and Juliana quickly located Helena, who was miraculously still conscious and trying to crawl away down the path. As Juliana picked up the spear that Neptune had dropped on his way down the hill, Helena managed to roll over and aim the knife at Juliana, but she was not able to even attempt to throw it before Juliana had stabbed her through the heart. When Helena's cannon sounded, Zuckerberg said that the other two had fallen further down the hill, and so he and Juliana ran down the hill as quickly as they could without falling. Meanwhile, Neptune was looking around for his supplies, and appeared to be heavily disorientated by what had just happened. However, when Neptune heard Zuckerberg and Juliana running towards himself and Rue, he seemed to come to his senses, and began to run to his west along the beach. Yet after a few seconds of running, Neptune looked back to Rue, who was only just beginning to stir, and after what seemed like a brief internal conflict, he ran back to help her to her feet. As Neptune limped away, he practically carried Rue around his shoulder, and she seemed to be trying to summon the energy to ask what happened. Neptune continued along the beach, but after a minute, he collapsed with Rue into the forest on his right. 
Mere seconds later, Zuckerberg and Juliana reached the bottom of the hill, and after a brief look along both directions of the beach, they agreed that it was too much of a risk to search for Neptune and Rue, so they walked back up the hill. Neptune and Rue spent the next two hours stumbling across the forests of this island to the west, often stopping for rest. Yet as the afternoon set in, they realised that the forest around them had become more humid and contained different kinds of plants and trees. Neptune seemed pleased to declare that they had reached the tropical sector, and the pair soon passed out from exhaustion within some covered undergrowth. Neptune awoke later that afternoon, and he quickly looked for anything that resembled a weapon, but with no success. However, he managed to ingest some of the humid liquids that had formed around the surrounding plants, which he proceeded to drink, although he still seemed thirsty. As the sun set, a light rain began to fall over this sector, and Rue gradually awoke. Neptune grabbed a large leaf for himself and another for Rue, which he encouraged her to use in the same way that he did, in order to funnel rainwater into their mouths. This worked, and Rue seemed to regain some strength over the next few minutes as she drank. Yet the storm soon began to worsen, and both Neptune and Rue were soon feeling the effects, with their hair now matted down against their heads, and the water soaking through their clothes. A cannon was heard, which was shown to viewers to belong to Brian from Ten, who had been buried by avalanches that had been triggered in the mountain sector. Neptune was then hit by a small branch from above, and Rue slipped on the mud as she tried to shelter beneath a tree. They sprinted through the jungle as quickly as they could, whilst looking for any bush or tree that could provide shelter. As the rain continued to lash down upon them, Rue found an overhanging tree and shouted to Neptune that they could rest beneath it. They sat there for a while and remained relatively unaffected by the rain. After looking around, Neptune spotted a tree in the jungle behind them, which contained branches that could potentially form weapons. He informed Rue that he was going to grab a branch from the tree for this reason. Rue nodded, and Neptune sprinted into the jungle behind them. Seconds later, a voice to Rue's right shouted her name. Rue darted her eyes over to see Alexio from Twelve, who had been following her and Neptune since he found them sleeping earlier that day. Rue watched in horror as Alexio ran towards her, loudly asking through the sounds of lightning above about who she was with. Rue immediately tried to convince Elixio to run, stating that Neptune was from two and that he was about to come back. Although Elixio was still trying to shelter his face from the rain, it was clear that he was in shock at what Rue was saying, loudly asking if Neptune knew that Rue was from twelve. Yet before Rue could even respond to this question, Elixio was tackled to the ground. Neptune proceeded to punch Elixio's face with such force that most of the back of his head became submerged in the mud below. Rue frantically watched, and she seemed to be in two minds about what to do. As Neptune pulled back his arm again in order to punch Elixio, Rue grabbed it and shouted at Neptune to stop. He glared at her, and Elixio, whose face was now bleeding profusely, shouted at Rue to help him. However, Neptune punched Rue in the face with his other hand, using such force that she fell back into the wet mud behind her, and he shouted, I'll kill you next, outlying scum. Neptune continued to pummel Elixio's face, and he let out an irate roar as Rue's eyes widened. She then turned and ran through the surrounding jungle, weaving between the trees and plants for the next few minutes until a cannon finally sounded. As Elixio's body was being collected by the hovercraft, Neptune marched around the nearby jungle, bellowing that he was going to kill Rue in the most painful way she could imagine, before going into intimate detail about how he was going to do this. Whilst fleeing, Rue had reached the edge of the jungle, before slipping down the muddy bank and into the river below. Although the current was very strong, she was just about able to stay afloat as it carried her through the twists and turns of the river. After almost a minute, Rue washed up on a bank, and like several of the other tributes at this time, she appeared to notice that the adverse weather conditions were appearing to settle. Rue wasted little time in getting up and continuing to run north into the forest sector, with Eugenia announcing that she had just become the first tribute to enter every sector, and Enya stating that this did not mean that she would win. Rue spent a few minutes aimlessly wandering through the forest and surveying the damage that had been caused by the tornado which had just ravaged the sector. She continued into a clearing before ripping off some branches from damaged trees and creating a shelter. She then slept for the next few hours and only awoke once it was dark. As for Neptune, he had stayed in the forest sector and spent most of this time punching the trees and ripping plants apart whilst roaring with anger. That evening, both Rue and Neptune were extremely thankful to be sent large supplies of food and water by sponsors. Furthermore, Neptune was sent an extremely sharp spear, with Enya stating that he was now almost certainly going to win. A tsunami had rolled from the perimeter into the island sector, and Zuckerberg and Juliana narrowly escaped, 
before making their way anti-clockwise around the arena, into the cave sector, where they were now hiding. As for Panama, she was also in the cave sector, where she had camouflaged herself for most of the games. Although she had avoided any conflict with another tribute thus far, she was now severely dehydrated after having only had a bottle's worth of water on the first day of the games. As midnight approached, Rue fell asleep again in the same clearing, whilst Neptune headed northeast through the tropical sector, before resting near the Cornucopia Meadow. At midnight, the portraits of Helena from 2, Brian from 10, and Elixio from 12 were shown, which left only Neptune from 2, Zuckerberg from 3, Juliana from 5, Panama from 6, and Rue from 12 remaining. Even though Rue had seemed exhausted, she appeared to have trouble sleeping that night, often jolting awake at the slightest sound before trying to sleep once again. When the sun began to rise, she gathered her supplies and made her way northeast through the valley towards the mountain sector. As Rue started walking, she ate some of her bread and looked carefully into the dawning forest that surrounded her. Yet after a few minutes, a tree that had been damaged by the tornado suddenly fell towards Rue. She noticed it only a few seconds before it would have hit her, but she jumped forwards and very narrowly avoided being crushed. Rue began to hasten her walk, but due to a technical glitch in the control room, a scurry of squirrels suddenly appeared on a path behind Rue and chased after her. She noticed their squealing growls when they were just metres behind her, and this led to her letting out a petrified scream and sprinting onwards. Although one of the squirrels managed to nip Rue's ankle, she was not too badly hurt, especially compared to other injuries that she had so far encountered, and within a few minutes, she collapsed into a valley that was halfway up the west side of the mountain sector. The squirrels continued to growl at Rue, but they remained in the forest sector, and Rue wasted no time in running to her east. She soon realised that in order to continue heading east, she would need to climb up one of the nearest hills, which she proceeded to do. Eugenia expressed her surprise at how quickly Rue was managing to climb, and after just a few minutes, she reached the summit, before heading back down the other side, which was covered in snow from the avalanches that had occurred in this sector the previous day. Yet as Rue started walking down the other side, she dislodged a large sheet of snow with her foot, which rapidly flowed down the side of the hill towards her. It was quickly noticed by Rue, and she sprinted onwards. Although Rue fell over and proceeded to roll headfirst down the hill, she had travelled far enough to not be completely buried by the snow, and after an exhausting few minutes, she freed herself and crawled onwards to her east. As Rue proceeded across the snowy clearing to the cave sector, Neptune awoke, after having heard the small avalanche that Rue had just caused. From the edge of the jungle sector, he spotted Rue running up the hills of the cave sector, which prompted him to grab his supplies and spear before running across the cornucopia meadow. Yet shortly after Neptune entered the cave sector, he saw Rue walk into a cave's entrance, and he appeared unwilling to follow her. Neptune proceeded to make his way up the hill towards a different cave entrance, where he waited and ate some of the fruit which he had been sent by sponsors the day before. Little did he know, however, that Panama was hiding a few metres away behind a scruffy bush. Rue travelled further into the tunnels, and unknowingly towards the cave where Juliana and Zuckerberg were still resting. Rue had initially been able to see through the tunnels that were close to the entrance, but she was now walking in darkness, with capital viewers seeing through the night vision cameras that she seemed to be trying to stay calm, whilst tentatively feeling her way ahead. Neptune took his spear and marched over to the cave entrance that he had seen Rue enter. He seemed just about capable of hearing Rue's desperate breathing that was echoing through the tunnels, and he grinned while stifling his laughter. Yet as Neptune looked back up the hill to where he had just been resting, he glared when he saw Panama running away with his bag of supplies. Neptune threw his spear towards Panama, but she noticed Neptune doing this, which gave her enough time to throw herself to the ground and narrowly avoid the spear. Neptune hurtled up the hill, and Panama seemed to panic, but she grabbed the spear from the ground and with a slight grin, she held it out as Neptune approached. Neptune wasted no time in running towards Panama, who seemed shocked that he was approaching her so quickly when she had a weapon. She jabbed it at Neptune's chest, and did manage to pierce his left pectoral muscle, but he quickly pushed the spear away before grabbing Panama and snapping her neck. As Neptune took his spear back, he painfully examined his wound, before grunting and stomping towards a cave entrance, just as a sponsor gift flew towards him. Neptune quickly ripped the bag apart, and smiled as he saw a pair of night vision goggles within. He let out a chuckle, before placing these goggles over his eyes and heading into the cave entrance. The crowds in Snow Square cheered, likely knowing that they were about to see an epic showdown. Seconds later, Panama's cannon sounded, 
and Rue breathed out in a panic. She ran faster through the darkness of the tunnels, often clipping herself on the jagged walls. After a minute, she collapsed at the bottom of the tunnel into a small puddle within a large cave. Unbeknownst to Rue, Juliana and Zuckerberg had been hiding on the other side of this cave, and they very quietly whispered to each other about who this could have been. Juliana grabbed a rock from nearby that she had found the day before. She and Zuckerberg listened anxiously as Rue got to her feet and loudly stumbled across this cave, seemingly unaware of the noise that she was making or the fact that she was nearing Juliana and Zuckerberg. Yet just as Juliana slowly raised the rock in the direction of Rue's footsteps, a painful groan was heard to her left. Neptune had silently made his way through the tunnels, thanks to his night vision goggles, before finding Zuckerberg and Juliana. While standing behind them, Neptune jokingly pretended to be thinking about which one of the pair he should stab first, before nonchalantly choosing Zuckerberg and stabbing him through the back with his spear. Juliana screamed and ran forwards before collapsing in a rocky puddle, as Neptune continued to stab Zuckerberg repeatedly through his back. When Zuckerberg's cannon boomed out, Neptune began to hum a merry tune before raising his spear and looking at Juliana, who was now begging for mercy through the darkness as she lay in the puddle. Neptune chuckled and slowly walked towards Juliana. She raised the rock in a desperate form of defence, whilst Rue crouched a few metres away, seemingly bewildered as to what was happening around her. As Neptune approached Juliana, she tried to get back up and run, but he stabbed her through the back of her head with his spear. As Juliana screamed, she dropped the rock, which fell towards Rue. Neptune continued to hum the merry tune as he stabbed Juliana, but Rue appeared to have heard the rock falling near to her, and she carefully crawled forwards and grabbed it. When Juliana's cannon sounded, Rue almost jumped once more, before crawling away and cowering against a stalactite. Neptune breathed out and yawned, before turning to his right, to see through his goggles that Rue was shaking with fear. He reached down and grabbed another small rock, before throwing it just to the left of Rue. She let out a brief squeal of terror, and Neptune had to stifle his laughter once more, with Eugenia jokingly hitting Ennius on the arm for laughing at Rue's terror. Neptune then threw a bottle of water, which landed on the other side of Rue. This once again made her jump, and she began to cry. Neptune looked at her with a rather pitiful expression, before affectionately running his hands along his spear and creeping towards Rue, whilst being careful to avoid the puddles that would make a sound if he trod in them. Rue was holding her breath as Neptune approached, and when he was stood over her, she still seemed unable to sense his presence. Neptune jokingly raised his spear and rotated it towards Rue, before appearing ready to thrust the spear through her heart. The crowds in Snow Square were so silent that one could hear a pin drop, but just as Neptune smiled and squatted down for a better angle to thrust the spear, an apple squeezed itself out from his trouser pocket and fell to the ground below. Rue jumped at the sound, but whilst Neptune looked down in annoyance, she lunged forward with the rock in her hand, which hit Neptune's knee. Neptune shouted in pain as he fell, but Rue lunged forwards and knocked Neptune against the ground, which caused his goggles to fall away from his eyes. Rue crawled on top of Neptune and punched his face with both her hands. However, after a few seconds, Neptune grabbed his spear, before bringing it against the side of Rue's head and knocking her to the ground. Neptune then sat back up and placed his goggles back over his eyes, but just as he seemed able to see through them again, his eyebrows raised as he saw Rue jumping through the air towards him. Neptune subsequently dropped his spear, and the goggles fell off the back of his head onto the floor. Rue climbed over Neptune, and after briefly grabbing his hair, he punched Rue in the face. But instead of appearing to feel pain, she simply jumped forwards before blindly feeling through the darkness for something. Neptune tried to grab Rue as she scurried forwards, but she managed to reach and grab the spear that Neptune had dropped, before turning it around and slicing it against the side of Neptune's head. Neptune screamed in pain, and Rue wasted no time in crawling towards him, placing her knees on his arms and holding the spear at the ready. Through his pain, Neptune proceeded to laugh, and he said that Helena had been suspicious of Rue's medical skills after the shark attack, but he had chosen to not listen to her. He breathed out and said, Rue Maluk from District 12. We saw pictures of you and your brother in a lesson at the academy a few years ago. I knew I'd seen you somewhere before, but I couldn't place it. I should have recognised you, but you've changed. You now look a lot more like your mother. Well, how she used to, before my uncle killed her. Rue seemed taken aback by what Neptune said, before shouting at him to not talk about her mother, adding that he may as well have been accurate, and that she had been killed by a woman. 
Through the darkness, only audience members were able to see the perplexed expression on Neptune's bloodied face. But as Rue once again readied the spear, Neptune laughed and asked Rue if she had ever even watched these games. Whilst continuing to hold the spear ready, Rue hastily replied that in District 12, nobody had access to the tapes of past games and that she was too young to remember them when they happened, nor did she even want to watch them as they showed her parents dying. As Neptune's laughter echoed through the cave, Rue looked through the darkness with disgust, and Neptune cackled that Rue's mother's games were his favourites, and that she should definitely watch them sometime. At this point, Rue finally lost her temper with Neptune, and plunged the spear down through his mouth that had still been open with laughter. Neptune coughed blood against Rue's face, and she proceeded to stab him all over his face for the next minute. Even when Neptune's cannon finally sounded, Rue continued to stab him, and it was only when game maker Artulia Fling announced that Rue Malak of District 12 was the victor of the 90th Hunger Games that she finally threw the spear against the nearby wall before screaming and crying, then vomiting upon the ground. Rue proceeded to get up and run forwards, frantically saying that she needed to get out of here before running into one of the cave's walls and knocking herself unconscious. The hovercraft then entered the arena to collect Rue, along with the bodies of Zuckerberg, Juliana and Neptune. After arriving back in the capital, Rue was held for the next few days in her apartment with her mentor, Gail, and her stylist, Effie, under the supervision of several identity keepers, who ensured that Rue did not have access to any capital television channels or past games. Rue spent this time recovering from her injuries within the arena and preparing herself for her victor's interview. For this event, she was adorned in a dress of different colours and fabrics that cleverly represented the six different sectors of the arena in which she had just fought. Rue was interviewed once again by Eugenia Ravenstill and Enya Stalton, with many capital citizens noticing that throughout this interview, she seemed rather distant with the pair, especially Enius. Eugenia proceeded to ask Rue the standard Victor questions, such as how it felt to have won for her district, and what she was most looking forward to doing after returning to District 12. Enius allowed Eugenia to take the lead during the beginning of the interview, but after a while he grinned, and asked Rue how she thought her mother would feel about the victory that Rue had just achieved. Curious sounds rolled through the audience, who clearly wanted to hear the answer to this question. Rue seemed pensive and looked back, straight into Ennius's eyes. However, after a few seconds of silence, the audience seemed to wonder why she had suddenly gone quiet. It was at that moment that Rue lunged past Eugenia and straight towards Ennius, knocking him off his chair and pushing him to the floor in the process. Chaos ensued on stage as Rue lashed against Ennius' face and yelled at him that he had killed her mother, whilst Eugenia looked on in shock at the audience, who were now on their feet, cheering, shouting and jeering at this most unusual scene. Guards quickly flooded the stage and seized Rue from Ennius, whilst the transmission on Capital TV was cut. Unfortunately, Ennius had to spend the next week in Ravenstall Hospital, in order to receive stitches to his face. After a thorough investigation, it emerged that Rue had had an argument with Gail during their first evening together in the apartment. This culminated in him taking her into the bathroom, where there were no cameras, although advanced sound recordings from the main room were later analysed in detail, which allowed capital investigators to hear Gail's voice in the bathroom whilst he spoke to Rue, admitting that he had lied to her and Crimson about their mother's death in the 76th Hunger Games. Gail had proceeded to tell Rue that it was Ennius Dalton who had killed Katniss, with Rue apparently believing that he won a later year at the games. Although she had become very angry, Gail quickly explained why he had lied to her about Ennius, and through her tears, she appeared to state that she now understood why Gail had lied and she forgave him. Yet once Rue had calmed down, Gail reminded her to not react towards Ennius during the victor's interviews, which Rue seemed to ignore. She was subsequently sent to Cardew Prison, in order to complete a sentence of three years for the assault of Ennius Dalton. However, due to an unexpected backlash and protest from a large number of capital citizens who supported Rue, a deal was offered by President Gaul that she would be released from Cardew Prison as long as she never set foot in the capital again, with her guardian, Gail, continuing as the mentor for District 12. The deal was quickly accepted, with Gail and Rue leaving the next day on a train for District 12. Unfortunately, this train derailed during the early hours of the morning, which led to the deaths of many on board. However, Gail, Rue, Ariadne Fling, and several others had made plans at the last minute to celebrate Rue's victory within the bar carriage, which lay at the back of the train. 
Although this carriage was damaged and its occupants injured, they were relatively unscathed compared to those who had been in other carriages, and none of the bar carriage passengers perished in this accident. After returning to District 12 a few days later, Rue settled down with Gail and her brother, Crimson, in her house in Victor's village. Rue spent most of the next year painting and producing art within the basement of the house, becoming very annoyed when anyone entered without permission. It was noted by many that this art depicted scenes from the 90th Hunger Games. Yet over the next year, Rue's mental state seemed to improve, and her brother, Crimson, took her on several tours of District 12, in which she re-familiarised herself with everything that had changed over the past year. Four years later, Crimson got married and opened a children's hospital with his wife, Plasma. Rue led a relatively quiet life in District 12, choosing to take a job in her brother's hospital. It was there that she went on to meet her husband, Santo, with whom she had a daughter that she named after her mother, Katniss. Thank you very much for watching and I hope you enjoyed. As promised, I'm now going to do a and a So, uh, one of the first questions that I have is one that I couldn't actually find where someone wrote it, but it was, will you only be focusing on one district or even tribute from now on? The answer to that is no, it's just the way that recent stories have been. Sometimes I will do that, because I find it can be a bit better to zoom in on two or even one in particular. Uh, the 87th with Sheaf and Pantena, that works a lot better I found when I just focused on those two and uh, progression in their relationship. The 89th, um, that was last, uh, the last one with uh, District 14, I focused on them only because I was going to focus on District 2 as well, but it was way too much with what was going on explaining the new district, and um, I thought it focused well on just using them. As for this uh, this week's games, I was going to focus on Phenomenon as well, but I found like it was important to focus on Rue, and I found if you focused on Phenomenon as well, it kind of unbalanced it, and I thought, let's just focus on her, because she's not necessarily going to win, just because I focus on her. Next question, Michael Watkist asked, what would your strategy be if you were reaped for one of the games? So, I would try to be nice to everyone during the training, um, I would try not get in anyone's way or anything like that, but I would try and make alliances as well. Uh, during my interview, I would try to be funny. Um, some people say I'm quirky, so I'd try that. Um, hopefully the capital would like me. I'm not sure about that, but we'd see. Um, then, when the games themselves started, I would potentially run in. But, sorry. Cleopatra was just trying to bite my t-shirt. Um, sorry. Um... Right, uh, where was I? Oh yes, blah blah. Uh, so I would, actually when the gong sounded, I would just stand there, wait for a minute. I'd probably be scared shitless, but I'd just wait. And then if all hell were breaking loose in the corner copa, I'd think, right, let's get the hell out of here and run. But if it weren't too bad, I might try and grab something quickly, then run. Um, I'd just wait a little bit, and uh, I wouldn't want to be the first out. I would be so embarrassed if I were... Um, I'd try to at least survive that. Uh, then I'd try to make an alliance with someone, um, sort of keep out of harm's way, keep us travelling to the edge of the arena, but I would be happy to break the alliance, uh, probably when they're sleeping, a bit mean of me, but probably how you'd win, and just hope for the best at the end. Uh, I don't think I'd win. Um, I'd try to go for miscongeniality, if that's a thing. Ooh, maybe I could make that a thing in future games. Anyway, um, next question. Hermen Borano. All right, sorry. Darling, stop it. Herman Borano asked, why is District 5 your favourite? So, um, I remember watching the original film and seeing Foxface and just thinking, wow, like there's something just about her I just found very intriguing. And I remember thinking, like, I'd like her to win. Uh, I knew she wasn't going to win, it was obviously Katniss or Peter were going to win. I remember thinking, though, I'd want her to win, and also they seem to have a rather sneaky nature, that district, and I kept thinking, like, that's sort of how I'd try and go about it, so I always found, like, I identified with them, and also they're a lesser known district, um, I'd like to see maybe more from them, if Suzanne Collins ever does another book, but I'm guessing she'd go with District 12 again. I remember when Bosas was coming out, Ballad of Songbirds and Sakes, I really thought, hopefully they'll go with another district, but... 
Uh, it was still it was still good to see more of District Tell, more of how the games started. Um, but I hope we ever get more that we'll see more of District Five. Sorry, darling. Right, you're gonna sit there on my knee for the rest of this. Yep. I'm gonna put her out. Sorry. <laughs> Apologies. Uh, so, number three, what was your favourite games to write, Alicia Covers asks. I've got a few games that I really enjoyed doing. Uh, I'd say the Capital Games was certainly one of my favourite. Um, I wasn't originally going to do it, but then someone suggested it. I thought, hmm, this could be interesting. It's got to be something different, though. And I suddenly thought, what if they could somehow, say, activate things in the arena? What if it could somehow be interactive? But at the same time, I always thought I'd love to see an arena that featured each district's productivity as a hazard and I suddenly thought what if you blend the two and that's how I ended up with that one so that was one of my favourites also one of my favourite alliance groups I also liked um, Tiffany in the 69th games in the Empire State Building that was a fun one to write um, can to change it around uh, 47th one with Brutus as well that was fun uh, can to think of different ways to kill someone and um, that was a tough one to write though I enjoyed it but it's tough actually that entire Group of five would type wireless. That one I can't hang to rewrite. Uh, rewrite. That was one of the hardest ones I've done. But uh, yeah, I enjoyed that one. Uh, Mr. Something asks Would you consider doing a collaboration video with other Hunger Games related channels, such as Story Divers or Movie Flame? It could be cool to see that happening for the hundreds of games if you're still planning on the mini games quell. I am uh, planning on doing the mini games quell. Um, as for collaborations, potentially, um, I think I have a bit of a different style to some other channels though. I mean, uh, Story Dive, for example, I like her videos, but she seems to be very faithful to the, um, to the source material by Suzanne Collins, whereas I am not completely. I kill off people all over the place. Uh, so I don't think we'd really blend together, but I still enjoy what she does, uh, but I don't think she'd want to even. If someone could think of a way somehow to do it, I'd be up for that. Um, next is Joao Victor Melgarejo. Sorry, I might pronounce your name wrong. Um, he asks, is there a Victor you regret? There is one. Uh, quite a bit I regret. I'm not going to say who, though, uh, but there is one. I maybe would have liked to go with something different now, but oh well, can't change the past. Uh, next one is Big Duel Sevens asks if you would go back to some of the first games of this series, which ones would you like to expand upon? Uh, the first one I would love to do. Uh, that would take a while to write the backstory, but I'd enjoy doing it uh, with Cassius Heath. That is thirteenth uh, with Claudia Schmidt in San Francisco. That would be a fun one to do. Um, cause touched on certain bits, but I'd love to do a bit more of certain landmarks and also Bluebells. Of course, um, that would be tough to write because you'd have to be pretty iconic, but that would be a fun one to do. Uh, next one, Hawkeye HCS asks, are you going to have some of the recent victors fight it out in a quell for one year? The answer to that is no, although it would be fun. I was thinking the other day, if you used all the victors since the reclamation, put them together, who would win? Uh, that would, ooh. I think any, Maxima, Maxima Liu could win. Um, maybe someone unknown, maybe someone less known or less, less able on the surface. Um, I don't know. Asha? No. <laughs> uh, she'd probably be a first out, actually. I think Ava would be an early out, but we'd see. Uh, let me know what you think who would win that. Next one. Dorothy Olsen asks, I am confused that Alicia won when District 2 was not focused. Can you explain this? Yes, I can. It's not always going to be the focus district. I sometimes like it when it's not the obvious person who would win something. Uh, although it can be a bit heartbreaking when you watch something and the hero or heroine dies. That's reality. And sometimes I like to just build people's hopes up and literally do that. Say what you will, but I don't always like it to be too predictable. So that's why. Also, Ennius, his victory, he was not spotlighted and he won. And I almost did it with someone else, but I won't say who. Uh, next one. In the 69th Hunger Games, oh, Walnut58 asks, In the 69th Hunger Games, Alejandro had something to do with a pregnant cow. So what happened there? This is something like the 797th time that you've asked this question. 
The answer to it is, I don't know. I literally just made it up. Alejandro did something with a pregnant cow and an Avox. In fact, he didn't do it to the cow, but it was an incident involving them. It's like the fishing trip in Gavin and Stacey. Even the writers don't know. Um, let's say, oh, I don't know, um, Alejandro put the Avox on the cow and made it ride around. And the cow gave birth. And the calf was fine, but let, let's just go with that. Yeah, if that makes you happy. Right. I hope that gives you an answer now. Next question, Lelo Lemon asks, what's your favourite colour? Blue. Blue's always been my favourite colour. Uh, next one, Steffi asks, are you a lover or hater of Marmite? I hate it. I really don't like it. I don't like the smell. I don't like the taste. My least favourite food though, baked beans. Literally can't be in the same room as it. Next one is Callum Swords asking, are you watching season 13 of Drag Race? Yes. Um, some of my favourites so far, Simone, Tanisha, Gottmik. My pick for the win is Gottmik at the moment, I don't know why I'm getting that vibe. Uh, oh, oh, I really like Denali's lip sync. And, oh, Utica, I really like her fashion. Um, I don't usually like comparing queens to each other, but she kind of reminds me of Thorgy Thor a bit. But I really enjoy her. Um, there's lots in this year's lineup that I enjoy. The one I don't like, um, probably figure out who that is, maybe? Well, I don't know. I'm not going to say anything. Yeah. Oh, slight incident involving Cleo. Uh, right, next is Ethicuxus Rochester. Sorry, I probably murdered that. Uh, asks, alongside from creating these vids, what else do you do as a hobby? Uh, I've got several things I enjoy doing. If someone had asked me this time last year, I would have had to honestly reply, I get stoned. But luckily, that's in the past. Uh, so, since then... Since becoming sober 10 months ago, I enjoy spending time with friends and family when I can, except obviously can't really at the moment. Uh, at the moment, I enjoy spending time with Miss Cleopatra when she's behaving herself, even when she's not. She's a darling, but I have to put her out then. Um, I'm going to enjoy taking her out as well, because to be honest, it'll be nice to get out of the house and I've got an excuse. Um, I like learning languages as well. I speak a few and like learning them more. Uh, I'm learning Swedish and BSL at the moment. And I am trying to get into competitive quizzing, like on The Chase, for example. I do like a good quiz show. Um, and I'm really trying to learn all these different bits of knowledge at the moment. For example, I was learning bingo calls yesterday on Sporkle, for example. Uh, I enjoy doing that. Um, working out, I'm trying to do a bit, lose a bit of weight. Um, and, oh, I'm big TV, TV buff. So I watch lots of different things. And I'm trying to go through my film list as well. Um, and yeah, those are some of my hobbies. Uh, next question is, Elise W asks, how are you dealing with lockdown 3.0 in the UK? Not brilliantly. It's not great. We can't go out here. Uh, well, you can go out to like, the supermarket, out to exercise, and that's about it. There's all these rules that just keep changing. I don't know if other countries have had this, but it's just change, change, change here. I, I'd say I follow the rules, but I don't really know what they are. Um, they're confusing as hell. Um, our government has, I'm literally embarrassed by our government, by how poorly they've handled this situation and the fact that they're not even admitting to have done this wrong, it makes me angry, uh, to be honest. I hope the vaccine works, I hope that it's used enough and I hope that um, it has a decent effect on people, obviously, and I hope that we can start to get back to some normality. Um, I'm not holding my breath, but I'm just glad that I'm not alone. I've got my family who are in my bubble, socially distanced as well. Actually, I'm not socially distanced with them because they're in my bubble, but with other people, I keep social distance. Uh, although we haven't had guests here for quite a while. I've got my housemate as well, Ricardo, who's um, a good friend of mine. Who So I, I'm fortunate that I've got with other people, but I just feel for certain that I'm around other people. But I just feel for certain people who don't have others. Um, it's, I hope we can learn from this though. That's what I will say. And I hope that the government are held accountable for their actions after this as well. And uh, final question though is from Jacob Carp 11 He asked, do you plan to go past the 100th game still? The answer to that is no, I'm not planning to go past it now. Um, I'm going to go up to 99th and then the 100th games are going to be a few different ones. More details will come soon. Um, I just want to... End on a high. I feel like got to a good place. 
I don't want it to like keep going on and on and on. Um, the way it ends, you will find out. Um, but I, I don't want it to sort of do a lost and just keep going for ages with no end. And so I end on a high. However, potentially in the future after a little break, I might come back to some past games and redo them in more detail. We will see though, but I will keep you informed. So thank you once again, and I will see you not this Monday, because I'm having a week off, but the next one after that. And I hope everyone has a great week. Take care.